Hello, everyone. Uh, good to see some familiar faces uh, and also good to see some new faces. Welcome. Uh, for the familiar ones, welcome back. Uh, my name is Jitesh Jaggi, and I'm still letting people in. Okay, uh, let's do this again. My name is Jitesh Jaggi. I'm the program coordinator and office manager for the National Indo-American Museum. If you wanted to attend Emerge's panel discussion unfolding, then you are at the right spot. And I'm still letting a lot of people in. Uh, we are expecting a good number today and I'm very happy for that. This is our third panel discussion of the year uh, so far. Hi Kimberly, nice to see you again. We are just gonna start in a couple of minutes or actually just one more minute. I wanna make sure everyone is in. Thank you for your patience so far. As usual, the chats are open for comments, questions. Hello, hello to everyone who just joined in. We're just gonna wait for 30 more seconds and officially begin. All right, let's do this. Okay, everyone, finally, welcome, officially welcome um, to Neem's panel discussion for Emerge Art of the Indian Diaspora. Uh, for those who haven't visited us, we are in Lombard in a physical space. Yes, we have our exhibition, our first inaugural exhibition that celebrates and uh, has on display the artwork by nine contemporary Indian American artists. And that's what we are calling Emerge. Our curator is Sharia Kumar. And for those who haven't visited, we would love for you to be there in person and check us out. We will make sure to give you a personalized curated tour. We are so excited that the exhibition has finally been extended till May 15th. Um, some real quick house rules. Um, you will notice that you're on mute. That's on, that's on purpose. It's all good. You still have a voice. Um, use the chat for any questions or comments you may have. And to set this off, I want everyone to please, actually you are already doing this, please type in in the chat and let me know where are you joining us from today. City, state, Adda, wherever you are, just type in where you are so we know. And so far we are seeing people from Portland, Vancouver, Chicago, Chicago South Side specifically, and Mumbai is so wonderful to have some international audience here. That's, uh, that's why we still want to continue with some Zoom offerings. Evanston, welcome, welcome everyone. We have a very colorful, diverse, at least geographically so far, audience here. All right, for those of you who, this, who are joining us for the first time, we are the National Indo-American Museum, NIUM. Uh, Neom builds bridges across generations and connects cultures through the diverse, colorful stories of all Indian Americans. We are a museum by Indian Americans for everyone. And we uh, have these programs just so um, for the benefit of the community at large. This program specifically is to um, have a panel discussion between three of our eMERGE artists, which you will, who you will hear from very, very soon. Um, we have a moderator today, our guest moderator. I'm going to welcome her real quick. We have Namita. Namita, I'm going to unmute you. Okay, in the meantime, I want to introduce Namita real quick. So Namita Gupta Wiggers, um, our panel moderator for today is an American of Bengali and Maharashtrian heritage. She currently lives in and works from Portland, Oregon. Namita centers her work on principles of inclusion and anti-racism in her writing, teaching, curatorial work, and art making. Namita, we are so happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. Um, uh, one, one thing I want to let our audience know is um, 
today's session, Namita, I was kind of envisioning as a more conversational, organic, relaxed sort of a format. Is there a specific um, reason for that, Namita, or did you just want to try this? Um, that's a great question. I think it's a little bit more, um, matches more my style of dialogue and exchange. Um, I've worked as a curator for a number of years, and now I'm working as an educator. And um, I find that I, I have different kinds of conversations with artists when artists are speaking to each other than, um, than sometimes in more formal kind of formats. And I think that um, what, we are, what we are envisioning is that this is a conversation that is an extension of the really fantastic program that happened last month with, um, that was uh, moderated by Kunkun Singari. And it was a fantastic way of setting up the, the ideas and the concepts that are in this exhibition um, that was curated by Shoria Kumar. Um, and basically what we're envisioning is um, this conversation with Kuldeep and Avantika and Nandita today is really going to be an opportunity to take some of the ideas that people may have heard in that panel or may have seen in the exhibition or read in the catalog about the fact that um, this exhibition is, is framed around the concept that there is no fixed singular identity for an Indo-American artist, that there are multiple identities. It's a very fluid type of an identity um, and that the questions around it are shifting and changing. Um, and so it seemed like a conversational format, something where each artist is going to introduce their work for a short period of time. So that that way, anybody who is here today who doesn't know the work very well, has a chance to see some of the work, hear the artists talk about their work, get a real sense of how different each of these artists are, hear some of the overlaps, but then also really recognize all of the differences and distinctions as well and how that creates this con constellation, if you will, of what the diasporic experience is. Um, I bring a different diasporic experience in too than, uh, than the artists. I was born and raised in the United States. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, one of my cousins calls me and you know, introduced me to the term ABCD. I don't think I'm <laughs> confused. I know. <laughs> I know where I am, um, but uh, but you know this is this is a really different kind of diasporic experience. And so, what's exciting about it is that um, the conversation is going to really turn around all of those. So, what will happen is each artist will present, and then we will move into a bit of a discussion amongst the four of us, and then open it up for more questions after that. Wonderful! I'm so excited. So, who's your first artist on the roster? Well, the first artist is going to be Kuldeep Singh. But before we go to Kuldeep, um, I do want to say one, one, uh, one thing. Um, I've been working on these questions about diaspora for a long time. I mean, I live it, much like the artists in, in, the, exhi in, in the exhibition of all. If you look at the statements, you can see everybody says, you know, this is a lived experience. This isn't something, this is something I am. This is something that I, 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 I engage every day. Um, this is something I live with, but it's something that I feel has changed so much. Um, I entered graduate school in the 1990s, and at that time, um, I was at University of Chicago. And so basically, you know, at that time, um, the conversation circled around questions about post-colonialism and globalization and cosmopolitanism. And these were the terms that were being used in academia to describe what all of the artists in this exhibition live every single day and all of us live every single day. Um, and it's really exciting to be at this place 30 some odd years later, which A, makes me feel old, but B, makes me feel really excited because there is such a different kind of conversation that's happening. So I'm very excited about that today. So, um, so yeah, so our first person that we are going to speak with is uh, Kuldeep, Kuldeep Singh. And, um, What's, what I wanted to share with you too is that um, rather than read the formal bios, what we are doing is I'm just going to give you a few sort of pointers to give you a sense of where our conversation is going to go later. So this is a way to sort of introduce what Kuldeep is going to talk about and, and each artist is going to talk about. And then in the, in the chat, you are going to get access to a document. 
that document is going to have everybody's um, full bio, links to their websites, any, of, any other information each artist wanted to share. So you don't have to worry about furiously writing notes down as you listen. You can focus on looking at the work, listening to the artists have conversations. Um, so that document is going to be posted and, and Sharia is going to help us by posting that. Thank you so much for doing that, Sharia. And we'll do it each time an artist speaks and we'll do it again at the end of the program so that anyone who joins us late can get access to that document as well. And so everyone later on as well. So you know, yeah, that's great. That's a big help. Um, wonderful. And uh, uh, so Kuldeep's work, um, I think uh, what I'd like you to, to listen to in Kuldeep's work, uh, in the way that Kuldeep is going to talk about his work is um, the way in which the body is engaged. The, the body as connected to classical Indian dance, classical Indian traditions, um, thinking about it in terms of uh, the fragmentation of narratives, that, that there's lots of different parts and pieces that are going into the work that's here, not just in terms of Kuldeep being a multifaceted artist. And, and, and to be quite honest, I don't know any artist who only works in one medium anymore. It's just not how it's done these days. So Kuldeep is a great example of, of someone who's working in lots of different ways to bring all these different aspects of identity into view. Um, but I really want you to think about the body in particular um, as you're listening and uh, the body in motion, the body in an image, the body in relationship to other bodies, I think is part of the, um, the diasporic and um, colonial condition we're still living in uh, that will come through in our conversation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kuldeep. Thank you. Thank you, Namita. Uh, Jidish, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jitish. Uh, from that, I'll uh, share how do I work. So, uh, so the video which you saw uh, is of 16 years of having understood dance, uh, the music component and learning the percussion instrument and understanding the complexities of uh, the Tal Vadya, which is rhythm and its complications. And here's a sketchbook which is filled with uh, everyday problem solving. Uh, dance and rhythm envisioned as patterns. Uh, many Indian uh, medieval texts talk about different patterns and diagrams, uh, ant-shaped, cow-tailed, barrel-shaped, uh, forms of expansion of rhythm. Uh, it is this rhythm and understanding of uh, visual art which brings me uh, to understanding film and the process. Uh, where collaborations uh, are the key aspect. Uh, this is uh, still from the Lima Center for Contemporary Arts uh, residency where I collaborated with uh, various artists, met people at gay bars, uh, film crews whom I hired and worked with and developed uh, an experimental uh, body of work. Uh, Again, collaborations and experimentations, taking visual art into costumes, into uh, music uh, 
is the core uh, building narrative invented from uh, Mesopotamian myths, Greek myths, you know, Indian mythology of certain regions. Again, as a painter, my approach is uh, all about incorporating visual art and dance together and film becomes a key medium in that way. Drawing again is very central where problem solving, idea building, thinking evolves. Uh, this is for uh, a project which I did in 2019, uh, which is called Through the Kali Ross. And here's the set. Uh, Through the Kali Ross is an immersive and hypnotic performance in installation where I collaborated with the artists named Cole Heinem, Jeffrey Grunthana, and Harsha. The project uh, attends to realities of the post-colonial world on topics related to power dynamics, queer bodies, ecology, and eventually questioning the heterosexist uh, notions of nature and its consumption. Jibrish becomes a very central tool, you know, uh, where the idea of suffering uh, and troubling oneself was incorporated uh, in the project. As suggested, uh, the Kali, the goddess of, uh, the Hindu goddess of destruction, power, eros, vulnerability is employed here as a trope to incarnate cruel expression uh, laid in the fragments which is creating uh, hybrid meanings. Uh, these acts were fragmented in nature and created a concocted world charged with pathos and eros. Uh, as I said, gibberish provided an oscillating confusion of emotions, uh, which unfolded on a cracked dirt ground in the knockdown center's industrial space here in Brooklyn. I also referred uh, to uh, the 12th century Sanskrit tome, uh, Manasol Lhasa, uh, The Rejoiced Mind, which addresses uh, an overarching nation, uh, nature of dance, bodies, environment, consumption, urban planning, and lots of aspects. This was a concluding shot of the performance, which was around an hour and 10 minutes. Post that, uh, since the pandemic uh, and limitation of not being able to perform, not being able to think collaboratively, uh, I've cocooned back as a pure painter, if I may say so. Uh, thinking, again, the aspects of nature, consumption, queer bodies, eco-feminism, uh, is now layering up uh, in lots and lots of small drawings, which is now evolving into paintings, uh, paintings of different size, small paintings, big paintings, six foot canvases, where the focus is how the musical modes or the Indian Hindustani classical system of music, the ragas, and referring to the Ragamala paintings of uh, 16th century to 19th century becomes a newer take called the new queer Ragamala, where inventive possibilities of connecting the male, mod the male body is uh, interwoven with nature. Both this piece and this piece are set to Rag Kedar, which is one of the ancient ragas of Indian classical music origin. The color blue, again, uh, historical in Indian medieval texts and texts of painting is referred to as the color of sensuality or of sringar. This is the last and the most recent work which I've just finished. So yeah, thanks. Kuldeep, well, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna put a pin in coming back to this question of the heterosexist construction of nature mm -hmm. and what you introduced about um, ideas about uh, how your work connects with eco-feminism and also uh, new queer possibilities for mm -hmm. thinking about the landscape because I think that th that's something that is um, 
there's some threads there with everybody yes. that would be good to come back to. Sure. So um, just wanted to make sure we, we catch that. Um, thank you so much. Uh, the next artist who's going to share their work is Avantika Bhava. And um, Avantika's work is uh, connects the built and the natural environment. Um, I think what is exciting about moving from Kuldeep's work to, talk, to look at Avantika's work is the way in which Avantika's, Avantika's work is about minimalism. It's about um, reducing to key elements. But what's interesting too is the body is still present, Avantika. In, and I've always felt this in your work in that you are envisioning, when, when I look at an image of your work or I see your work in situ in an installation, it's always a, turns me back to thinking about my own body in that space, engaging it. And so that's, that's another thread that I see going through here in terms of this, this um, juxtaposition between built and uh, natural environments, but also what it does to you as the viewer in terms mm -hmm. of your location in there. So that's something that um, I wanted to point to as you begin speaking about your work. Cool. All right. Am I on? I guess. All right. On. Namaste. Namaste, everyone. Satsriya Kal. Copy to all, as my dad says. It's really nice to see this range of people from Bombay, Portland, New Jersey, uh, I think Singapore. So thank you everyone who's made it today and especially for the people on the West Coast because it's 8.30 a.m. and you were denied an hour of sleep. So special shout out to you. Big shout out to Sharia and Jitesh for making this happen uh, and to everyone at Niam for making the show a reality. And thank you, Namita, for joining in. Um, when you did, it's been an honor to finally get a chance to work with you. All right, so I am, um, you guys can see my slides? Excellent, all right. So as Namita said, my work is very much entrenched in the idea of site, space, geometry, grids, et cetera. And in thinking about this, I realized it might have a lot to do with where I grew up, which was Bombay and then India. I'm the child of an Indian Naval officer I grew up in very regimented bases, but surrounded by chaos. So this contradiction of chaos and order, loudness and quietness, presence and absence is something you'll see as a running theme throughout my work. In this series, in this talk, I wanna focus specifically on three pieces, starting with the scaffold that I did two years ago on the run of Kutch, a vast open landscape. The idea for this came very serendipitously when someone once asked me, actually my uncle in Mumbai said, what do you wanna do with this chunk of change you've just earned? And I said, I want a bigger, big gigantic pink structure in the middle of nowhere, preferably somewhere that has whiteness, but is in the homeland. And what better than uh, the Ran of Kutch? Why pink? Uh, I did not know at the time. It was a very gut reaction, but in thinking about it, uh, uh, later on, I realized there was pink in that environment, whether it was in the nomadic kachi embroidery or the pink flamingos of the surrounding grasslands, or it was that very poetic glow of the sunrise in the morning that was just completely mesmerizing. So anyway, I had this grand vision. I wanted to create something big and pink. I had some funding, no connections, but I took a leap of faith and in the process made some really great friends. And thanks to people at Agricell Industries, this gigantic structure soon became a possibility. Um, um, I am strong, but not that strong. So having people help me is always good. And working with, uh, with these, uh, these folks from the villages of Kutch and uh, surrounding villages of, of um, Maharashtra too was a great way to just quickly erect the structure in seven days. And the crew I worked with was extremely Energy, energized, entertaining, and at first very confused about what the heck I was doing. But as the structure started to get built, they were like, this is art for art's sake, basically, isn't it? I said, sure, it is a basic, it, it is the symbol in the environment that is asking you to think about the environment and whether you want to talk about it eventually politically because of its, uh, its um, closeness to Pakistan, or if you want to talk about it as a, as a commentary on climate change, so be it. Or if you want to just enjoy it for what it is, this just this awkward alien thing in the middle of nowhere that eventually hopes to bring people together so that they pay closer attention to the landscape and maybe even pause and enjoy the absence of light pollution in India for a brief moment. This 
was a happy surprise. I had not thought about what the scaffold would look like at night. And it was one of those few moments where I actually cried looking at my own work. Um, and the structure was to come down in uh, March 2020, but then as we know, the pandemic hit and India was in a lockdown and no one could go to take down the scaffold. And soon the land got drier and drier. And before we knew it, a uh, monsoon hit and uh, the image changed, but because of the corrosion of the metal, because of the softness of the sand, the piece started to sink and gradually it started to collapse. And in the process, it became a whole new work in itself. I'm normally very, very particular about how I want the work to stay. But in this case, I embraced the idea of the collapse. And my colleague and friend Jennifer wrote a really beautiful piece about how a single work of art could basically tell the story of resilience, the pandemic, and time. So the pink scaffold is still out there, maybe buried underneath. I don't know. So that is a work I did and it still exists. I've been making many iterations of it. But besides uh, scaffolds, what I also do is work a lot with drawing. It is a huge part of my practice. When I can't work with people outdoors, if I can't work physically with larger structures, I'm just as happy working quietly and monistically in my studio, making drawings of buildings. And my love for buildings, I think, also comes from this uh, having grown up in, in Bombay and then coming to Chicago for grad school in 96. My recent affair, and I call these drawings of buildings affairs with buildings, has been with the Veterans Memorial Coliseum. I like that the, that the building is so kind of structured and geometric and gritty, but it has lots of narratives of sports teams that have won championships out there and also tainted histories of uh, of communities that were take, uh, torn apart when this Coliseum structure was built. So in the series, I've basically taken a single building and made many, many iterations of it and playing with this idea of repeating the same idea over and over again to see what might happen. And I think part of this idea of repetition and, and redundancy comes from teaching and having to teach the same material daily but I also get a kick out of repeating myself. And I don't think my family might enjoy that, but that's what I do. I repeat and repeat. But in the process of repetition in art, something new constantly is uh, springing up. So this is my homage to the Memorial Coliseum. I've been doing drawings of other buildings as well. And you could check out my website if you wanted to know more about them. Um, I wanted to come back to why we are to here today. Um, when Shoria asked me to do something at uh, NIEM, I started thinking about the building and how I wanted to point towards it and how this idea of pointing and marking can be a very direct way of drawing attention to something while also kind of spicing it up, adding a little masala, if you will. So uh, when I looked at the structure of Neum, it is a decent building, but it's not that interesting architecturally. So I literally wanted to just sprinkle it with some bursts of color. And knowing this was Chicago and it was soon going to be covered with snow and be very dreary in October, November, what better way to add a little spice than just big bursts of color? And my bursts of color were basically these pink uh, dots. I chose the pinkest pink, which is a color that was patented by uh, a British artist in retaliation to Anish Kapoor's Banta Black. Anish Kapoor is another Indian artist, artist of Indian descent who's done the Big Bean in Chicago. It's a beautiful uh, uh, piece of uh, sculpture, but the fact that an artist thinks he or they can own a single color is kind of problematic, but it's also interesting. So as a partial response to that, I chose to work with this pinkest pink, also because it really brightened up the space and added a little sense of zing or spice to it. Plus the dot was a direct homage to the bindi and also the idea of dot, 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 moving on, dot com and the industries where we, Indians have kind of dominated. But at the end of the day, it's just the simplest and most complete mark, in my opinion. And I'm, I've been excited to see the photos I've been getting as snow is setting up or if someone's come dressed in pink, just using this super pink uh, dot as uh, a background for selfies. And with that, I say shukriya. Thank you. And that's my website.
And that's me after I ran a race many years ago with the orange dot. Excellent. Excellent, Avantika. Thank you so much for that. Um, I love the way that uh, the different relationships to, um, to space and time are coming up in both of your work already so far and thinking about the built environment and the way, um, the way that we document that environment that I had not seen that image of the, um, of the piece at night and with the night sky and it's absolutely breathtaking. It changes just the, the temporal shift there is, is in terms of understanding time of a day, but then the way you brought in time of, of um, COVID and the monsoons and everything is, is absolutely exquisite. Thank you so much. So now we're going to hear from Nandita. And I think that this question about uh, the depiction of the landscape is a really great um, tie-in to what your work uh, is about and things that caught my attention about your work. Um, Nandita is, is uh, in, Var in uh, you're in Varanasi right now? Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so she, uh, she's calling in from, from India itself at the moment. Um, and uh, the thing about, uh, this ties in with things that both um, Kuldeep and Avantika have brought up about uh, the constructed environment. And I think your work is, is what caught my attention about your work is the way that you are looking at depictions of the city in your work. And um, it brings to my mind um, so many sort of Western, so-called Western writers thinking about Georges Perec and looking at everyday life and the way that we look at the tiniest moments, Merleau-Ponty walking through and the phenomenology or the experience of walking through a city. Um, but you're taking this also into the question of image and which bodies are moving through. So again, some of these themes that are, are coming through, but each of you is engaging it really differently. So with that, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Namitha, so much. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here, and I wish we were doing this in person, um, but the privilege of uh, having people from across the um, across the continents um, is quite special. Now I can truly call myself an international artist. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna, um, uh, give me just a second. Let me share screen, bear with me for a second, please. <clears throat> Um, so I'll be sharing uh, parts of one body of work, um, and uh, that's the work I'm exhibiting at the um, at the museum, the National Indo American Museum, as well. Um, so the title of this work came out of reading um, Simone de Beauvoir um, and her book, The Second Sex, where she writes, "If the body is not a thing, it is a situation." How do we experience a place, a culture, its politics through our bodies? And here I'm thinking of body as something that's gendered, um, that experiences pain, that's vulnerable, um, and that houses our biases. So these are some of the questions um, I'm asking uh, while making this work. Now I'm focusing on the city of uh, Varanasi or Banaras. Um, in the northern India as a, a sort of a stand-in for the Eastern mystique. Um, Varanasi, as, as most of us uh, might know, is um, an ancient center for uh, both religion and philosophy and has therefore attracted people from both inside as well as outside of India. Um, so growing up here, I encountered uh, ubiquitous representations of the city um, as paintings, etchings, um, and later photographs. Um, we are looking at a, a, a photograph of the ghats um, of Manikarnika, uh, which was taken by the British photographer Samuel Bourne. So how do I encounter this very specific kind of visual imagery that is limited to the facades, which are exoticized and disciplined under the aesthetic paradigm of the picturesque? 
Um, this is uh, one of the works uh, which is uh, a part of the exhibition. Um, it is an overhead photograph of layers of printed text. Um, the photocopies which are in the bottom are from the book From Merchants to Emperors. And on right hand side on the top um, is a page out of Allen Ginsberg's India Journals. Um, it, and it is a concrete poetry where he writes, coming down the stairs step by step down to Lochan's pants seen through seen down seen down through the doorway to the street and the shape of the words um, resonate the shape of the of the steps or the carts um, and there's a sort of like queer element or even um, uh, uh, a, a, a pointing to, to the body by bringing in Trilochan's pants, uh, which might be, I, I, I imagine, uh, might be something that uh, Ginsburg encountered um, drying on the steps. So um, I'll read a small um, excerpt from the page that we are looking at that's part of the photograph um, so that uh, we, can, we can maybe talk about picturesque. The profusion of architectural monuments, temples, mosques, bridges, and ruins were indeed objects that suited the cult of the picturesque. If human figures were needed to enhance a landscape, India afforded, India again afforded picturesque material that would have met with the approval of Gilpin, who pleaded with his artists to avoid ladies with parasols and concentrate on bandits with flowing cloaks. So the piece uh, basically sort of uh, uh, talks about uh, how picturesque that word and that notion came into being, um, the fetish uh, for the bright light and shadows, and sort of the building of the mystique of the of the East. Um, this is an installation shot um, of uh, a stereo card. Um, with a, the object that you're looking at is a studio card uh, viewer. Um, it's, it's essentially a VR um, object, uh, but one that's historical. Um, and I came across these studio cards in my parents' library, um, and they were of the tour of, um, of India. So these cards, uh, sometimes a hundred cards, sometimes even more, um, were part of albums that companies like Underwood and Underwood um, would publish and um, sitting in your in the privacy of your homes in the United States, especially um, you could uh, do a tour of of India or China or Asia or so on and so forth. Um, so when I started looking at these cards, um, I realized that the the image is framed in the service of, for instance, the Qutub Minar over here. Um, and, uh, you know, it is very much about the exquisite Persian carving, uh, which is on the minar. And the minuscule figures um, at the bottom of it um, play a subsidiary role as a measure of scale. And so it's a very specific kind of framing um, that uh, has a hierarchy uh, that it, it follows. And so I wanted to disrupt this kind of viewing where from two dimension, we could go into uh, three dimension and get that sort of extract that pleasure of visiting the place. Um, and uh, I traced the Qutub Minar out and put in this, uh, this text, uh, which is uh, again, the same text, which was used in the last piece. Uh, what I'm going to do is is do is is uh, show you a GIF um, to just give you a sense of um, what uh, what that disruption feels like. So you can't quite take in the minar, and you can't quite read the entire text, and both are sort of displaced from their position. Um, in the same sense, um, in terms of uh, resisting uh, or having a conversation with how. Um, structures are framed, how a city is framed. Um, when, I, when I photograph Banaras, for instance, this is a photograph on the ghats in Banaras. Um, I went on top of the um, uh, uh, old structure by the river and looked down and photographed the steps themselves. And so um, there isn't necessarily um, an agenda for establishing any place. 
uh, but rather, I guess I'm more interested in the transience of the movement of people, you know, walking across, and also something which is slightly out of my control. And so, bringing in that aspect of of chance, perhaps. That's an installation shot um, from um, the museum. So I started reading um, Allen Ginsberg's journals of his travels to Varanasi and later came across um, the American photographer William Gedney's diaries, also from his visit to, uh, to Benares, um, as well as the journal of Alice Boner, who's a Swiss artist who lived in Varanasi for almost 40 or so years. Um, and this photograph was taken in her library while I was consulting um, some of the books. So the research work falls into the final images themselves. The informal and fragmented voice of the journal really appealed to me. It stemmed from personal experience. It was meandering with the potential for recursive practices of reading, writing, and walking. Um, so I adopted the stone to approach the heady and iconic city of Benares. And I intentionally photographed the transient and the insignificant aspects of the city um, and refused to establish places. And although I'm um, taking on the methods of the journal, I'm not interested in a biographical telling and feel more drawn to subjectivity. Um, I'm discovering through my body, who am I as a subject? Um, and here the body is a stand-in for the intelligence that we have in excess of the rational. Um, I'm not wanting to position the body in opposition to our minds or, uh, or the rational, um, because this notion of separation in itself, I think is a construct, one that came about post enlightenment and thrived um, during, the post, uh, during the colonial era. So the gesture of looking down is a way of locating myself it is also a way of situating myself back into the social cultural geography to sense how it informs my becoming. And, and so feet became a recurring motive in the, in the work. And on one instance during my yoga practice, I happened to be attentive to my feet and how it bore my entire body weight. Um, in this pithy act of my feet, its contact with the ground got activated. The difference in temperature of, uh, of my body with that of the floor, for instance. I'll read a little excerpt uh, from uh, some written pieces that go with this work. Um, drawing feet from photographs of my foot, including cracks and dead skin. Looking down, I would stare at my feet during the months I was feeling burdened. Mahamaya's feet though are spotless no cracks, no dried skin. In our visit to Bharat Kala Bhavan Museum, Naval Mama distinguished the Greek influenced statues from other Indian statues. He thought the Greek statues were more real, imitated the human body as is in their proportions. The other gods and goddesses followed the stature of the imagined ideal, a better version of humans. While drawing the minute sweat glands of the feet, I see all sorts of things in them clouds, ellipses, spheres, and void. Without the sweat glands, Mahamaya must feet, feel, um, Mahamaya must retain a lot of body heat. This is a close-up drawing of, the, of a drawing of my foot. Um, and as I was drawing the foot from a photograph that I took of the foot, um, it really started to make me think of latitude and longitude and mapping in general, and, and body as a map or in fact, as earth itself. When you walk with naked feet, how can you ever forget the earth? Um, this was a quote I came across in William Gedney's diaries, which uh, he had found in one of um, Carl Jung's um, written works uh, from his visit to Benares. And I think this is where I'll, I'll end. Thank you so much. So I think you're gonna, you can all see everybody who's here uh, participating in this program. You can see that an hour goes very, very quickly. And um, it is very challenging uh, to, um, 
to make sure, you know, to, to, to bring all the conversation that we would want to have in. So what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to ask one multi-pronged question and let the conversation go from there. And then I might jump in at some point if there's some place that I want to bring something back. Um, does that sound okay to everybody? Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Okay, cool, cool. Um, this was fantastic to get to spend some time with each of your work um, and hear you speak about your work has been has been great. And I'm sure that's going to be you know, very exciting for everybody uh, listening to be able to go back in and look again and think again in, in different sorts of ways. Um, I want to I wanted to come back to this question about um, heterosexist construction. And I know we talked about that at the beginning with your work, Kuldeep, mm -hmm. but I want to extend that to heterosexist, patriarchal, colonial constructions in a much broader sense in terms of how we learn and what we learn. And I want to talk not about colonialism, but I want to talk about the ways each of you is pushing back on those con constructs, because I think that's a much more interesting place for us to discuss, um, rather than have it be where we're situated in what we're doing to undo the enlightenment, to undo the way that you know we've been put into situations where education requires us to know Greek myths, but doesn't necessarily honor Indian myths, so to speak, right? Um, where it's about, oh, it, there's so many different things I could touch on from there, but. I would love for each of you to, to think back and share with all of us how your education, and I don't mean formal education only, but how did you learn and what are you doing in the way that you work that pushes and brings lots of aspects of your learning into view in your work and through your practices? Sure, I think uh, I'll begin uh, because that directly relates to what I was talking about. Uh, for me, I think the whole idea of man being not the center of nature comes from uh, understanding Indian classical dance of Odyssey, the literature which is involved, you know, that how man and nature operate simultaneously. And the colonial education, if I may use a word, which is a very British education, which we have received in India, and all the laws of science and physics which have etched uh, in the colonial uh, discoveries and inventions which came that man is the predominant thing. And I think that's where we forget uh, that in all the Indic texts, the idea of Shakti, the feminine being sacred, the cosmos is sacred, you know, uh, and quoting here Vandana Shiva that the land from where the resources come, that is sacred. And I think that shift of me not being in the center, the land being the center automatically becomes very fascinating to me, you know, and that is where for me personally, the, uh, the ideology of ecofeminism and not accepting the heteronormative uh, aspects change the whole modus operandi for everything, you know. And then Indian classical music, for example, if you may talk about, you know, the, the origin of the nine swaras, which are very much uh, the nine, uh, this, uh, sorry, the seven swaras, uh, which again overlap with the Greek music, uh, which becomes Western music, have their origin uh, in uh, the sounds and frequencies of different animals. You know, each note has a different frequency and vibration. And I think that knowledge is a profound and a very a profound source of gravity to think on like how nature and man operate as one but not as someone who's at the pinnacle. And I think that changes the whole idea of like how we consume every tiny thing to the way we live, you know, and produce things, so yeah. Excellent, thank you. Does anyone want to pick up from there? Um, I might not have as an in, uh, intense or academic response, but here we are sitting in America talking in English. I mean, that says plenty. If for five seconds we transformed and we were in India, we'd probably be speaking English, Bengali, some Urdu, some Punjabi, Marathi, and that to me is where the magic lies. So, um, and that, yeah. So it's, it's not a statement, it's more an observation. And I think some of that experience has shaped the way I think, which is why my practice kind of uh, situates itself in any new uh, surrounding and site specificity as a response to that. I get up, I relocate, I'm in a new situation and I respond to that. And I do so by creating really simple gestures. 
seemingly simple gestures. And I think some of that comes from also just thinking about the notion of zero or shunya, which comes from, from India. So I lean towards that a lot and it has shaped my thinking. But um, I don't know if this is answering your question, but growing up in India was a huge part. And you know, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna to answer to every Western academic who wants my work to be very Indian in the way they think it's Indian. It is. It has the essence of India because I spent more than half my life there. So whether it is talking about the conflict between chaos and order, whether it's talking about the sense of movement, structures, grid, et cetera, it exists in a, in a larger lens, so as to say. Great, thank you. Um, Namita, do you want me to chime in or them? Sure, I think yeah. That might be yeah. yeah, okay, so very quickly, I think um, what I would say is um, um, in, in, in general, I find myself resisting any, any sort of position that puts me um, in, in, a, in a box and that asks me to, to lose my ease and play to a certain definition that, uh, that is coming really from the outside for certain reasons, whether it is the morality um, or, of heteronormativity or it is the culture that consumerism brings. Uh, because I feel th that all of these things, um, as well as uh, you know, uh, a move towards ecology, can happen and will happen um, once we actually um, try and sense into um, our real experiences, right? Our lived experience, rather than the moments where we are playing up and are anxious uh, uh, in playing in playing into and playing up to certain expectations and identities. So here is, I think that's where, because we are in this historical time. I think I find myself resisting heteronormativity. If we are in a certain other time, it might be something else. But even one idea of queerness, I think, is something that I find problematic for, for myself. Great, great. I feel like I want to move to Reet's question here. Uh, Reet is asking a question. Um, Following my question, uh, that they are interested in how armature figures in your practices. This might mean architectural scaffolding, the foot that supports the body, or in parenthesis, gendered, radicalized expectations that choreograph our body. Thank you. This is a great. This is a great question that ties in with this question of education and knowledge and 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 the the construct of what makes us think and do and be and so forth. So yes, yeah, so thinking about armature and scaffolding um, and this question, does anyone want to, uh, to, um, to speak to Reed's question? Um, of course, if you use the word scaffold, I'm gonna jump right in. And I think it's a be <laughs> beautifully worded question. My work is essentially a framework, just like uh, Nandita was talking about the format and the shape of the slides. My, my scaffolds are essentially doing the same. They are lenses through which you see the space you're in, whether it's an open space of uh, the run of Kutch, or it is the interior of a crumbling building in Bombay or Astoria, Oregon, where I've done iterations. The idea is these literally are like post-it notes, highlighters that are forcing you to acknowledge where you are now and the space that is, uh, is around. And then layers of meanings are added to it, whether it is someone who comments on how the scaffold was symbolic of climate change, or a colleague of mine who used the cover, uh, an image of the, the Rand of Scotch piece uh, for the cover of his book on queer uh, issues in Bombay in Hindutva Triangles, um, a book that I will share the link to, so. Super. Does anyone else want to touch on that? Otherwise, I have a, one more question I'd love to ask. Maybe I'll respond really quick uh, to it. Um, I, I think, you know, one of the ways um, I think about armature, especially working with the medium of photography, is to uh, become really um, alert to all the instruments that are used, not just outside of the image, but also within the image. So. So me as the person who has the camera, the person who took those stereoscope photographs and framed, uh, you know, those people in a certain way, um, I don't, I feel like, um, um, you know, we've all sort of absorbed these images uh, to a very large extent and a lot of work is 
to perhaps uh, using your word, uh, 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 Red, um, we need to rely on the armature of our body, which is more rooted in our ex everyday experience. And why the ev everyday experience is because um, that's where we can find our truth, uh, where we are not stuck in some sort of rationale or some sort of ideology, uh, because there's always um, an argument uh, that's possible against an ideology, but there isn't necessarily an argument to an experienced truth because you've experienced it, you've lived th that truth. And so that's why I feel like, you know, one of the ways to understand, at least for me, you know, uh, these, these instruments or armatures is to become very, very aware and alert um, to, my, to my own body and how it is responding to these sort of situations. And for in one line for me particularly, that armature is the knowledge, is the way I function, and the way I connect these dots. And then trying to create and using the word choreographed all these components and connect the dots. For me, I think that also becomes the work and simultaneously the armature, you know, where through plural possibilities are constantly happening and cross fertilizing and cross connecting with each other. So, yeah. Excellent, excellent. So Harveen has a question about um, the major differences that you have found in the reception of your work in the US and global contexts and the Indian and global South contexts and how you negotiate these. And I'd like to extend if, if, if um, Harveen, I hope you won't mind, but I'd like to extend your question to also um, in, your, in your thinking, you know, this question of reception is such an interesting one, um, but I'm also curious too, not just in terms of how others are receiving your work and what you what interactions you have there, but I'm also interested in what questions do you wish people would ask you that don't ever get asked and that you wish somebody would say, you know, can you tell me about X, Y, Z? Um, because I, and I'm, I'm seeing these as two parts of reception in a sense. One is what you wish people were asking and the other in terms of what, what Harveen is pointing to in terms of what people are asking you and, and are, are kind of responding to. So I wanna throw that out as, a, as a, the next question. Multi-parts, I know. And I'm doing that on purpose, y'all, because to me, this is messy and complex. And the simpler the questions, in some ways, the more it disallows for the, the complexity of what it is to be um, an artist and to be who you are. So um, that's a bit of what I'm playing with, with my multi-part questions. So how people are receiving it, and then what you wish people would ask you. In, um, can I just go for it? I, I think in the US or in the West, often the challenge is, and this I've learned to ignore it, is like, why is, what's the, where's the Indian element? I'm like, uh, uh, me, that's the end and that's the beginning. And if you need more, then, you know, go to, I don't know, go read a book on, on India, but this is what I do. And I'm not going to unfold it for you. You will, you will figure it out yourself. And sometimes that is, it is frustrating for my audiences because I have to explain and I'm trying to do that less and less. Mm -hmm. But yes, it's the, that, the, the question of what, what makes it so Indian. And so I would rather not have those questions. I wish there would, I, there, I wish there would be more questions about just the work because that at the end of the day is what's most, most significant for me. And when I show the same work in India, I think sometimes there's an honesty, like the workers at the run of Kutch and the way they just looked at the structure for me was more satisfying a response than anything I've gotten from a major critic or a curator or a collector because it was sincere and honest. So at the end of the day, when the work can and does speak for itself, whether it is uh, over here in the US or somewhere in Europe or back in India, that is the most, satisfying and successful situation for me. And sometimes I'm like, I, I don't want questions. This is my work, that's the answer. I'm not gonna mm -hmm. load you with more narratives. Yeah. You know, thank you for saying that Avantika uh, and carrying it forward from what Avantika said. Also, I think it varies a lot from how much complexities you weave within one work or how minimal the second piece is, you know, for example, if I'm to talk about my work and I've stopped giving as Avantika said over this, I've learned it not to give uber details because let the person on 
unopen like a book, you know, read them. But I think, yeah, certain nuances, which I would have done had I been in India anywhere, you know, or say somewhere in Europe, I'm now trying to do the same here, you know, let the other person do the homework, you know, because if you are aware on so many political ideas, you're aware on so many uh, issues pertaining to the current and the past, the kind of components which I am bringing, which are very, very visual, let them be visually handled, you know. And rather than, I do not want to decipher the visual, whether it is a film or whether it is a choreography. Uh, and I'm here also not questioning the issue of the spectacle. I'm not bothered about, oh, this is spectacular. This is exotic. I've forgotten those questions. Maybe it, for many people, it is still spectacular, still exotic. For me, it is not, you know, and I think that's an, a huge question, uh, which becomes a baggage. And I, I, I have that baggage, I don't know for you, or, me it's not a baggage yeah or vice versa you know yeah um I, I guess i would just say um one of the differences i find between um showing some of the works which are um which are relying on a certain specific history let's say uh you know in in Benares or in india um and i'm showing that work here in india or in in the u.s um, and in the U.S. too, there's such a, you know, such a such a range of people, um, you know, people who are quite aware um, of uh, of temple architecture, for instance, and people who aren't quite aware of it. Um, but I think maybe one of the things that that happens is um, is the privilege of uh, finding a very quick entry point that I that that I see people who have um, some sort of fluency. Um, or have lived in India and have lived the culture, uh, find themselves in, in that position. And so the conversations then um, sort of already enter through the, the door and they are inside, if I can use that analogy. Um, while, uh, you know, if, if someone is coming to it completely cold, uh, it might become sort of a slightly longer process and, uh, and the work can be slightly demanding in wanting people to slow down and do the work um, that they need to do to get to understand all the facets. Um, but of course, I agree with you know Kuldeep and uh, and and uh, Avantika that um, I think the the ultimate sort of benchmark for a good uh, artwork is one that speaks for itself. So and that's you know something that we we all probably um, we are all attempting to get there and get there sometimes and uh, not always, but that certainly is, uh, is the desire for sure. Uh, in terms of questions, I will just say that um, uh, I, I love when there's a feedback loop. Uh, I love when actually there, there are conversations, questions, any kinds of, you know, any sort of thing. Cause I, I do feel that I'm not, I would not like to make an isolation that sometimes the next uh, image or the next work comes out of certain questions mm -hmm. um, in and around the work that I have not thought of. Mm -hmm. uh, I would just want to add one more thing into it in terms of uh, your work and also the identity parcel which gets attached to it and as we said uh, how the person should read it. I technically live in two boats like being a contemporary uh, visual artist who does films and painting, uh, which is a broader array of uh, things. But when I am doing a piece of Indian classical dance, which is rooted in mythology, a very specific mythology, a very specific history, very specific body language and costumes, attire, that certainly becomes, oh, this is very Indic, this is, and that of course has a limited audience. But when that is applied in a larger context, where the deconstructed, rearranged, amalgamated with other components, its narrative completely changes. So that's another reason why I may give nuanced answers to certain audiences in a certain body of work, versus vice versa, you know, where I think, no, let you do the homework, you know, this is visual, the, the text mm -hmm. and understanding is more global and vast, you know, rather than something which is very cultural. So the difference between the cultural and the contemporary is something which I often handle, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. 
Um, thank you all for the time and for sharing your thoughts. And um, time is so short, and I'm so sorry we have to conclude our, our program today. Um, but I wanted to say thank you so much to all of you. Thank you, Jitesh, for all the organizational work. What I love about where this conversation went is um, that it, it each of you is pointing to um, a refusal of being neatly categorized in any mm -hmm. way, shape, or form. And I think in many ways, this is, um, for me, as when in terms of my curatorial work, or if I'm writing something, um, I, want to, I want to dig into work that I have to wrestle with, that I have to think about in multiple ways, that I think I understand one part and it opens up another way of understanding it. And that is what I think each of you offers. And I really appreciate getting to spend the time thinking about your work. And I hope, I hope to continue these conversations with you um, further down the road right. as well. Thank you all. Thank, so thank, you. thank you, Namita. Thank you, thank everyone. You so much. Thank yeah. you. Happy thank Holi, you. guys. Yeah. <laughs> yes, happy Holi, yeah. definitely. Um, Quick, quick, quick announcement before you start dropping off everyone, the audience. Um, one is you didn't think I forgot, right? Like I um, have made the donation link and it's in the <laughs> chat. Um, anything that you can spare to uh, donate to Neom, we would really, really appreciate that. Um, all the money that you donate today will go to uh, organizing similar cultural programs, programs with artists, um, we will take $10, $20, $25, $100, whatever you can spare. If holy, the spirit of holy moves you, absolutely donate $1,000. But any amount that you can spare, we would love to um, make something of that. We would love to bring some similar presentations to you. So thank you for considering to donate to us. Um, I also want to remind everyone that you heard the artist today, but you will want to experience the, their work. You will want to see their work. Please do not miss on that opportunity. It's only till May 15th. Please come to our museum. It's in Lombard. Um, you will have the address in the email. Uh, all these works that you saw on PowerPoint, they look much more beautiful in person. I can attest to that. So please um, schedule a visit with us, neam.org. Um, lastly, I just want to thank all the artists here. Um, uh, Nandita Raman, Avantika Bawa, Kuldeep Singh, our uh, curator as always, Shorya Kumar for uh, being the guiding light for us. And last but not least, a special, special thank you to our guest moderator today. Thank you so much uh, to Namita Gupta Vigars for, for just for doing this. All right, thank you everyone.